Why in the world would you engage children and youth in evaluation, right? Why in the world would you take that on? And we got a little insight um, before. You might take it on for program improvement. Does anybody have any other reasons that they might uh, engage children and youth in evaluation that you can think of? Yeah, it empowers young people and gives them some power over the program. Anybody else have some other ideas about why? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to just repeat it. It's, it. It changes the perception of um, adults about youth and what they're capable of. Other thoughts or ideas? More useful data. More useful data. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> um, anyone else? Well, there's lots of reasons. I think some of you have named uh, the ones that I'm going to bring up. Um, one that nobody named is that youth learn some research skills. They learn the skills of research. They learn inquiry. They learn um, how to question. They learn how to create surveys. Um, they learn to be criti better critical thinkers. Some people do it um, because it's a fundamental right. And as uh, someone who's worked with the Convention on the Rights of the Child for a lot of years, um, there is the treaty states that young people have the right to participate in all decisions that impact their life. And so evaluation and research is really a, a critical way to engage young people in thinking about the issues uh, uh, deeply before they engage in decision making. Uh, some people do it because it's, does, it gives you better data. It gives you more youth authentic voice in the data. And, um, and some people believe that young people are more willing to talk to other young people. So there's different kinds of conversations that come up in the data when young people are talking to one another. Uh, some people do it because if you've done the better data, you're going to have a better program, right? You're going to improve your program, and you're going to improve it in ways that are meaningful to young people. Uh, and some people do it because you improve civic engagement, and you can um, young people can gather data and have more community action and be more engaged in the communities. And often, I think to somebody else's point earlier, I've seen where young people are seen quite differently in the community because they've engaged in research or evaluation. And all of a sudden, um, those young people who weren't allowed in the corner store are all of a sudden allowed in the corner store. And they're telling me that the adults in the community are seeing them in a different way. Um, and then there's this one. <laughs> It's cheap data collection, right? Not one that I particularly value, but one that people talk about often. But all of these different purposes, um, or as I say to my staff, perpi, all these different perpi, <laughs> lead you to some kind of different strategies in engaging young people, right? And some of them are multiple and, and cross-cutting. But the reason that you engage young people often changes the how you engage them, right, and what you wind up doing with them. Um, but for me, the reason that I've gotten into this field is because I'm very much interested in igniting human development, right? And for me, I, and actually I took human out of my slide when I edited it, and I didn't do it here, but it's to ignite, it's, for me it was about igniting development. And I mean human development, I mean community development, I mean programmatic, organizational development. So my definition of development is very much influenced by social cultural learning theory. And so for me, development isn't just about the intrinsic internal processes that young people go through in terms of their maturation, but it's a very participatory process. And it's the ongoing, continually emergent, social, cultural, relational activity that people themselves create. And so for me, I believe that youth participatory evaluation gives us and provides us a space for young people to engage in creating their own development in some very unique ways. And this definition of development has kind of been at the center of my work um, since before I even knew what development was, or I'd even thought about what development was. Um, and as a young person myself, who had um, traditionally been a failure in, in school and in traditional educational environments, I kind of sucked. Um, and I was not at all, as somebody said to me the other night, well, you know, where were you tracked to go to college? And I thought, well, I wasn't tracked to go to college. I wasn't going to go to college. I wasn't going to finish high school. Um, and I dropped out. And I ran away from home. And I moved to New York to become an actress. 
And as an actress, I experienced a very different kind of environment. And in my environment as an actress, I was reading Shakespeare. And I was performing Chekhov. Um, and I was doing things that I could have never imagined doing in a traditional learning environment and I had never done before. And I knew that there was something very different for me going on in that context than had ever happened to me before. And um, the question of why that was happening led me to go back to school. Right. The question that I had going back into a traditional educational environment was why in the world was I growing in my theater group and not in school? Right? And I am. I immediately met um, a Vygotskyan scholar, uh, Lois Holzman, who began to help me understand a little bit about why that was happening for me and help me begin to explore those kinds of environments. And what I was finding was that in theater and in my theater group and my ensemble, the activities that I was engaged in weren't about knowing. I didn't have to memorize anything, although I, memor I wound up memorizing scripts, but I didn't have to know how to quote Shakespeare. I wound up learning how to do that. But it, they weren't about knowing. I wasn't being tested. They were about creating. They were about a creative activity together, which was very different. My coaches and peers were relating to me as, and what I mean by this, and I think that was a question at my table, not as if, but in theater, you have to relate to people as their performance, not as if they're performing. Can you imagine watching a TV show and being thinking the whole time, like, I think it would be really interesting if that person were um, really a secretary or as if they're acting as if, but you're really in, you, people are really seeing you as who you are becoming in a continual way. And in theater, like no other, people were relating to me as very capable of learning and performing Chekhov, as very capable of taking on new kinds of performances and roles that I would have never taken on before. Um, I was encouraged to creatively imitate others. Now in school, this is called cheating. <laughs> but in performance, this is very much encouraged for you to imitate others. And, and I, the word creatively is there because you aren't others when you're imitating them. You are still very much yourself. It's a big um, myth in acting, right? People who meet you say, oh, actresses, you can't trust them because you never know who they really are. I would say that you are more yourself than you've ever been when you're acting and creatively imitating others because you're bringing yourself very much into the role and you're simultaneously stretching that role. Um, and the environment demanded that I take risks and stretch, some serious risks. It, it required that I constantly take on new roles, constantly stretch myself, constantly creatively imitate others to discover more about who I was. And last but not least, the ensemble was focused on creating an environment in which we could all grow, right? There wasn't a competition about who was going to get an A. There was there was a sense that we all needed to do well in order to pull off a performance that was great. And so it was an incredibly supportive environment and you really were focused on everybody doing their very best, everybody growing, everybody continuing their development. So to me, this was a very different kind of environment than what I had traditionally been involved in with school. And thankfully, um, my undergraduate and graduate education was pretty non-traditional. I went to Empire State College where I was allowed to create my own curriculum and was allowed to um, engage other people in the learning that I wanted to uh, be involved in. So if you wanted to learn about developmental psychology, I went out and found 10 other people who wanted to do that. And then I got Dr. Lois Holzman to go to Washington Square Park and give us a lecture, right? That was the way my education was done there. Um, so. So I found a place where I could actually learn in, an, in a more traditional setting with still some untraditional <laughs> components to it. And um, with, with Lois, I really learned that development is participatory. And she had me reading a lot about Vygotsky um, and teaching me how, why it was participatory and how that mapped onto my experience as a performer. Um, and again, um, what, what Vygotsky talks about a lot, and you'll, see, you'll have seen it in my previous slide, is that 
Development is participatory and relational, and it occurs when children and youth creatively imitate each other. Notice that that happened to me in theater. And when they are seen as not only who they are, but who they're becoming, right? And when you're relating to them, as he puts it, as a head taller than who they actually are. Um, and he termed that activity the zone of proximal development. Has anybody heard that term before? Yay, zone of proximal development. <laughs> so some people have taken that to actually be a space, a literal space, quite literal, between um, a young person often and an adult or somebody who's quite skilled at something. But something that I discovered about theatrical spaces is that there were multiple zones of proximal development, and they were continuously being created. And so in that way, I found that performatory environments were what I call ZPD rich, right? They were really rich on ZPD, um, which is quite different than, than um, the more targeted uh, educational environments where um, there, there might be a ZPD that's being created, but in performance, everybody was kind of creating one, and anybody could be more in advance than you in, in a second, and you can always be learning from somebody else. Um, I also learned that performance was a methodology that ignited development, because in my experience, I had seen that in the performatory spaces that I had worked, that, that all kinds of development was occurring, not just learning, but development. And then finally, in my as I went into graduate school and I began to work um, with Roger Hart on children's rights and participation. So I moved away from performance and expanded my, my view and my study to look at participation because it seemed to me that performance and performatory spaces were radically participatory, right? And so when I, be when I went to graduate school and I began working with, with Roger Hart, it was very early on when the Convention on the Rights of the Child was just being ratified. And we were being called on quite often to help people figure out how to create participatory environments that would help young people engage in their decision and decisions that would impact them. So we're doing this for quite a while and we were doing a lot of youth participatory action research and creating all kinds of programs um, and, and supporting young people to create programs. And we had a youth journalism program running in our office for like seven years. Um, but somebody at, at some point called and said, great, 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 awesome, so good that you're doing this work. Where are young people in terms of evaluating the programs that are meant to serve them? And that was the question that led, that's led a very long journey to where I am today. And there weren't that many programs that were doing that kind of work, but there were a few scattered about uh, this country and Canada that I was able to take a deep look at, and that became the topic of my dissertation. And interestingly, and probably not coincidentally, what I saw when I went out to study uh, these kinds of programs is that they were highly performatory, right, in all the ways that I just mentioned, that young people were being related to um, kind of as scientists, as capable, as experts, right? Young people were being looked to for their expertise, so they were being related to as who they were becoming. They were creatively imitating scientists often, and I mean creatively because they weren't looking like the academics that we all know and love. They were looking quite like themselves and, and being quite creative with their performance. And they were, they were, and we were talking a lot about this at American Evaluation Association um, this weekend, they were doing new kinds of epistemology. They have new and different and creative ways of coming to know and understand their universe that adults weren't, so they were creatively imitating scientists. They were breaking out of their fixed identities as learners and recipients of knowledge, right? So they weren't just little banks to be filled, but they were actually actively engaged in creating um, their own knowledge. And as they were performing in these roles, they were, and this kind of goes to my point that I just made, they were tra simultaneously transforming them and coming to see themselves as participants in the creation of perhaps new societal roles in the way that I just mentioned. Um, and I think they were beginning to understand their significance in history and their powers as agents of change. And so this is what I mean by YPE having um, a strong affordance for young people to engage in development, not only their own, but societal. So, um, so recently, I was asked to write a book chapter in, in this book involving children and young people in health and social care. I was asked to write a chapter on whether and how YPE transformed youth-adult relationships. And of course, I'd seen that happen many times. Um, but as always, I, I'm having, um, 
when I'm asked to speak for young people, I have somewhat of a chemical meltdown. And so I had this you know, existential crisis in my, in my office about why am I being asked yet again to speak for young people? Like, where are the young people? Who voted me a good partner? Like, did anybody vote me a good partner? <laughs> so I, I started to think, well, maybe I'm not. And then I started you know, rifling through all my notes and what young people have said about me as a, as a partner over the years and sort of calling young people who are now 30 something that had worked with me saying, was I a good partner? Because I really don't know I'm supposed to write this chapter. Um, so after I finished my existential crisis and I was struggling with the fact that young people are nowhere in the writing up of their research um, experiences, I um, I started to take notes from what a young woman, uh, Naomi Ortiz, had written about our partnership together and piecing it together into a one-act play. Now, I'll say that that's what I did in this moment, and then I'll say, say that as a part of the youth-focused TIG um, that has just been created at American Evaluation Association, we're really committed over the next couple of years to get young people's voice out there in publications more and to get their writing about their experiences in evaluation research kind of out in the world so that it, it, there's actually a body of knowledge and it's not just disappearing and people like me are standing up saying what I think's happening. Um, but anyway, what I did for this publication, since I wasn't able um, to have young people write, was I wrote this one act play. And the reason I did was because of this. When I, when I was asked, does YPE transform youth adult relationships? Naomi in the front part of my book said, indeed, she thought it did, right? She's a young person. Um, but I've actually seen it where it didn't. <laughs> I've actually gone to see some youth participatory evaluations and research that weren't radically transformative, um, where the adults were very much relating to young people as needing to learn the you know, scientific skills. And it looked much like a classroom where young people were learning some things about research, which is great and nothing, uh, nothing wrong with it, but it wasn't fundamentally transformative in any particular way, shape, or form. And some people were actually using the activities right out of my book. So it doesn't mean that if you're using, you know, YPE activities, that it's just going to transform life in general, right? There, you, have to, you have to engage young people in a different kind of way. So why is it so difficult? I forgot my slide. It's, I think it's difficult for adults, and I think there are many reasons why it's difficult for adults and young people to transform relationships, but I think it's difficult because I think you have to be pretty intentional about radically shifting our performances as both adults and youth. I think both adults and youth have to radically transform their relationships in order to have, uh, to, to have this transformational uh, relational experience. Um, it requires new values, new language, and in my opinion, it requires some development on, on both parts. So I wanted to show you what this looks like. I, I, I believe that per, uh, performance and the creative arts brings a lot to play when we're trying to transform relationships because in some ways there's no right answer when you're creating together, which is different than in school, right? There's a right answer. I know the right answer. I'm the adult. You don't know the right answer, and I'm going to tell you. In creative arts, there's no right answer, right? So it, it allows you some play room and some wiggle room to create together. So I've thought about how do you really intentionally carve out performance as part of the evaluation process, but, but also it happens implicitly in conversations with young people. And I would just show you how that played out with, um, with Naomi and myself. So scene one is about accepting offers that young people make to you, right? So here's what I said that Naomi and I were doing. In 2001, I was invited to work with a national youth-led organization called Kids as Self-Advocates. It was a grassroots project created by youth with disabilities for youth with disabilities. CASA was founded on the knowledge that youth can make choices and advocate for themselves if they have the information and support they need. When I met CASA, they were under pressure to find an adult who could help them garner the information they needed to create an evaluation plan. This was part of their work for the U.S. Diana Princess of Wales Fund. So they were kind of being asked to really ramp up their skills internally and build their organizational capacity using evaluation. Their previous partnerships with adults had failed, and they had recently fired several consultants prior to calling me. So you can imagine that I was terrorized. Um, I really 
the, the, the consultants they had fired before me were great. They were really great. They were highly participatory, great youth workers, and I was scared when they called. I didn't know anything about the lives of young people living with disabilities at all. Um, and from the start, I was pretty aware that if I was gonna take this project on, I was gonna have to develop, right? So Naomi said, <laughs> When I met Kim, we were in the middle of an organizational development process, which meant figuring out why the pro what the project does, how it works, and why it works. When we were told that we were expected to come up with an evaluation plan, it seemed overwhelming. By the time Kim came on board, she'd heard of our issues in working with other evaluators to develop a plan for our project. Other evaluators had not grasped what we meant when we said we wanted an accessible process. They did not understand why having everyone involved, no matter what their disability, was essential. So we got on the phone together and I started talking to their core group of young people who were gonna engage this process with me. There was a committee and then we were gonna engage their entire board of directors in the process. And really at the end of the first conversation, um, they weren't convinced I could do it. And I wasn't either, frankly. So at the end of the conversation, we were grappling around and I wasn't sure I was gonna take the project and they weren't sure they were gonna hire me and we were really in this awkward space and somebody on the phone said, Kim, what do you need from us? And at first I was a little taken aback, but for my theatrical performance days, I realized this was an offer. They were offering to help me and they were offering to help me not because I was awesome and a rock star, they were offering to help me because they needed my help and they knew I was gonna fail them too, right? So I saw it as an offer. I saw it as a unique offer. And in acting, um, learning how to identify an offer is really key when you're on stage. Learning how to identify an offer and build on it. And um, in order to do it, you really have to be able to recognize it. You have to be able to be open to new possibilities, which means taking young people's lead when, they, when you don't know where in the heck they're gonna lead you. Um, and you have to give up your performance as a knower, right? So I, I saw this as an offer. And I have some explicit activities that I've done around teaching adults how to accept offers, um, which I can get into later and is in this latest book chapter I have, which I'll share with you. And I won't get, in, I won't get into that so deeply right now. But. So you not only have to be able to recognize when an offer was made, but in performance you have to be able to advance the offer, right? Has anybody seen improvisational troops on television, right? So somebody gets up and says, I'm a giant pink elephant, right? And then if you, if you um, get up on stage and say, the next actor gets up on stage and says, no, you're not, scene over, right? <laughs> scene over, that's it. So somebody has to get up on stage and say, and I'm a little tiny fly living on your tail. Now we have a scene. Right? So I've not only accepted the offer, but I've advanced it forward. And that's how I think about conversations with young people. So what did I say? I let them see just how scared I was. And I said, here's what I want from you. I want you not to fire me. And they laughed just like you did. And I said, no, I'm really serious. I want you not to fire me. And I'm going to need your help because you're going to. Right? So I not only accepted their offer, but I advanced it and I made a demand back on them. I need your help to not fire me. We have to figure out how to do this together. There are no other consultants lined up behind me to take this job. All right? So that was a real, that was a real turning point for us in our relationship together, honestly. Um, and we both talk about it a lot. Um, we're still friends to this day. Naomi is an awesome evaluator, and she's an adult now. Um, so... How do you advance offers? You have to stay in the moment, you have to listen carefully, you have to build with what was given to you, and in, in performance you have to make your partner look good, right? Always, you're always your focus on making your partner look good. So how do you make the young people look good? How do we make each other look good? And I have a couple activities, we're gonna play some later. One is called the yes and game, where 
you really learn how to build a story collectively by um, accepting offers and advancing offers together. And one is called The Hypnotist, where you learn how to move together dynamically. So I have a couple of things that explicitly help folks to, to, to kind of do that kind of work. Now, building with everything. Building with everything is absolutely key in performance. And we, as adults working with young people, are particularly bad at this, right? This is some, an area that we need a lot of work on. Usually when young people are giving us stuff that we don't like, we squash it as fast as possible, right? Young people giving us bad behavior, we shut it down. Young people um, giving us information that we don't particularly like and we tune it out and we pretend like it didn't go on. Um, I'll give one example. Dana Fusco was here last, is one of your last speakers. Did anybody hear her? So Dana and I worked together 180 years ago in Harlem and we ran a um, sexual reproductive rights street theater program. And I'll give you a great example of building with everything you have. Dana and I did this. So we had this um, group of young people, young performers, and um, one young man in our group was uh, tracked out of the traditional classroom and he was labeled with a learning disability. And the other young people in the group weren't. And in our after school program, they came together and were supposed to function together. And you can imagine that they weren't functioning very well together. And they had lots of labeling and lots of bad mouthing and bullying of one another, both sides, frankly. Um, and things had been escalating for a while and we did what all good adults do. We kind of ignored it, right? Hoped it would go away. But we kind of knew somewhere in the back of our mind this wasn't gonna go away. And it had really ramped up quite a lot. And at some point, two boys, the most popular boy um, from the traditional educational model and, and the young man that had been labeled with a learning disability, got into a fist fight. And I don't know about you guys, but I have been in the middle of those with young boys before who are often bigger than me and got my butt kicked. So I wasn't particularly interested in getting in there and pulling them apart. And I looked at Dana and she looked at me and we started a fight. And we hit the ground the same way they hit the ground. And we were rolling around and screaming and saying all the same stuff they were saying, which I can't say here. <laughs> and the boys were on the floor next to us and they got up and they said, what are you doing? <laughs> we said, we're doing you. We're performing you guys. And then they said, that's not how I did that. <laughs> what I did was I said this, and then he said that, and then I hit him, and I said, okay, wait, wait, let me, okay, get up, Dana, let's start this again, right? So we got up, and we started taking direction from them, and they started sharing, and then this started happening. Another young girl said, wait a minute, this fight started way before that, I instigated it. Oh, really, okay, tell me about that performance, okay. So I was instigating it three weeks ago, okay, really, okay. Next person, okay, but you know what, I got involved because at school I did this and this. So I got everybody's roles down that had been, this fight performance had been taking place for months and everybody in the room had had a role in it. And everybody was self-identifying their roles in it very happily because now we are creating a performance with it. <laughs> And then we were able to take all of that mess and say, well, what other roles could we have played during that period of time? What are some of the other ways we could have done that? And we did six, seven, ten uh, renditions of the fight, right? That's building with everything you have. That's not denying that that fight was taking place. That's having it, really having it, and unpacking it together. Um, and with Naomi, what I had to build with that I really didn't want to build with is the fact that um, these young people hated evaluation, hated it, hated it. They were disabled youth. They had been evaluated to death and had it completely shaped and reshaped their lives. But that's what we had. That's what we had to deal with. So what Naomi said about that, so she said, to me as a disabled young person, evaluation meant that an adult, usually non-disabled, made a judgment about what kind of classroom I could be in, what kind of say I could have regarding my own health care and my own body, and even the extent to my participation in the community. Evaluation represented power over every element of my life, as I believe it does for most young people. Right? This was a group of young people who had some real strong feelings about evaluation. And um, we're talking about it over here a little bit with Deborah, that, um, 
you know, sometimes young people are really willing to jump in, but usually young people have some baggage around the terminology, evaluation, assessment, et cetera. This group had a particularly bad, um, bad experience with it, but I think unpacking it with young people and having some of that with them is really important from the very beginning, but how to build with that is, is and not deny that that's been actually their experience. You can't just say this is an immensely positive thing and you're going to learn so much and all of this when they actually have some really negative baggage. So um, in, in terms of this, you really want to relate to every new piece of information that young people are giving you. As, as, prime, as like a primary piece or key piece of information that's gonna advance and develop the performance that you're doing together. You don't wanna deny their stories because they're only gonna come up and bite you in the butt later like my fight. Um, and you wanna transform your judgment into exploration and really get curious about why they're saying what they're saying. It'll only help you better understand their experiences and, and, and help them bring forth their, their authentic youth voice. Um, and one of the things that you guys just did where I, I do a lot of human surveys where I have young people get up and say, do you love evaluation, do you hate evaluation? Have you had a lot of experience with evaluation? Have you a little experience with evaluation? Or reflections on a word where I say, what's the first thing you think of when I say participation? And they shout words out. You know, they don't have to know, I just shout it out. And what is the first thing you say, you think of when I say evaluation? How do those things come together? How are they different? Why? Right? Um, have a complaint symphony activity, which is um, where I get young people up who have lots of complaints about whatever it is. Evaluation's judgmental. It um, it's defines me. It boxes me in whatever it is. And I have them all stand up. And then we actually have a symphony where each one of those complaints is an instrument. And I conduct the symphony where I might raise up the judgment and lower down the boxing in and bring them all up together and just let them have it. Just let them get it out of their system and really build with it. Um, do a storyboard logic model where young people um, write their stories about their programs in their own words and through pictures and drawings and images where they're allowed to share some of the, both the, the good and the bad about their program. Um, and then this piece, which you've heard me talk about a little bit, which is scene four in our play with Naomi. So Na Naomi says here about my relating to her as, she says, Kim listened to her frustration and then to our surprise, then surprised us all by agreeing that she did not have the expertise needed to complete the plan. Instead, she told us we did. It took hours for Kim to explain the YPE process to a few of us. Then we translated the language, processes, and activities to make them accessible for our community. So here what happened was I was up with them for hours and hours and hours, and I kept coming up with creative, playful ideas to engage the young people in. Well, young people with disabilities, and we had a board with um, some were quadriplegic, some were paraplegic, some had learning disabilities. The number of disabilities in the room were vast. And every activity I came up with, there was a reason why it wouldn't really work for the population. So what I decided that I would do was teach them everything they needed to know about evaluation and let them facilitate the meeting because they clearly understood more than I did how to have that conversation with the youth in the room. So I acted just as a resource in the corner and they kind of facilitated the whole meeting. By the way, it took them a lot less time to learn everything I knew about evaluation. <laughs> so it was a great process. Uh, Naomi continues to say, as disabled youth, we are often viewed as the most vulnerable, the most unable to know what we need. To have a non-disabled adult tell us that we could be the experts to decide what would work for us was profound. This philosophy shifted my view of adult youth partnership and most of all changed my idea of what my role as a co-chair of an all youth board should be. This experience, um, through this experience, youth board members became more than leaders. We became responsible for our own community. And so it was a small shift, I thought, a small thing for me to say, you all can do it. But for her, it was enormous. And it, it shaped the way she thought and shaped the way that she continued to do her work. So I think this idea of relating to young people in the same way we did in theater as, as opposed to as if, is really important. 
um, and really how to be intentional about creating activities that allow youth and adults to stretch beyond their current development, exploring new roles and new ways of being in the world. And again, I have all these great theatrical activities. Um, one's called the Gibberish Expert, um, which is where one young person is the evaluator, and another young, and that evaluator um, doesn't speak English, but they speak whatever language they come up with, um, Martian or um, any other language that they, they decide. And the other young person is the translator of the gibberish expert. And the idea here is that the expert, the, uh, the expert has to perform as an expert even though they're, they have no idea what they're saying. And the translator has to perform as a translator even they don't know what the gibberish expert is saying. Um, and then they, they do a performance. And it's usually quite, quite fun and quite funny. But it is this idea of having young people explicitly learn how to relate to each other as something that they aren't quite, which is a you know, Martian-speaking evaluator. Um, but it's quite fun, and they learn, they learn a lot about how to do that in an explicit way. Um, also has some activities around um, when young people, there's a lot of roles in evaluation, right? So interviewer and data collector and data analyst. And so we'll do one minute performances where they're all at a cocktail party and I go, quick, you're a survey designer. And they run around and kind of talk to each other as that role. And we do lots of quick one minute performances where they're all doing the same thing so they can get a sense of how it feels to be in that role and what kind of thing they might want to take on in terms of the evaluation process. Um, and also I have a talk show performance that's, that's also quite fun. Um, so just to keep in mind, when using kind of a performatory approach to YPE, stay in the moment, listen really carefully, give up knowing in exchange for discovery, this one's hard for us, use everything that you have to build with, accept all offers, relate to youth as more than who they are, but also who they're becoming. Uh, provide some opportunities for them to creatively imitate. And focus on the creative act rather than just the outcome. Focus on the moment and the creative act. All right, so this is some tips to leave you with. And then also, um, there's this great wing spread declaration of principles for YPE. Um, this, I think we decided that this was 11 years ago, that a group of us came, came together twice, that we're working on youth participatory evaluation and youth action research. And we really grappled uh, with some young people in the room, not as many as I would like, but some there, about what are the principles of this work and what can we all stand on and work together toward. And this was the principles we came up with. And Katie Richard Schuster and I just had some nice conversations about this. We all agreed that they are still good <laughs> this weekend. Um, but the, the first principle is transform, uh, the, the, that in doing a YPE process, really think about transforming participants, our way of knowing, the strategies we devise, the methods we employ, and our program of work, right? So really think about it being a transformative process, not just about a specific outcome, that, a one specific outcome, but a, a kind of suite of them. Promote youth empowerment. Build on mutually liberatory partnerships. We're going to talk about these in a minute. Equalize power relationships between youth and adults and thinking about ways to do that. I mean, I, there are some things about research that help that happen, um, but I think you have to take a, a, a real strong look at that and continuing to think about that throughout the process. Engage inclusive processes that recognize all form of democratic leadership, young and old. Involve youth in meaningful ways. Um, I think this is a really key point here in terms of what's meaningful and kind of t paying attention to what's a meaningful, a meaningful way of engaging young people so that we're not using them mechanistically or um, manipulatively, which is I think happens more often than I'd like to see. Um, it's an ongoing process, not a one-time event. This one's also hard, I think, because 
of who young people are and their trans ever going transitioning lives. But ideally, youth participatory evaluation would be a part of ongoing programming and something that happens in a continuous way.